this country has been able to hold a lot of koalas. We, we've had very high densities in this area. It means that the, the country can be really good for koalas. I've been working in this area for the last 10 to 12 years. And what we've really noticed over that period is there's been a massive decline in the numbers of animals. At the moment in our study group of animals out of 20 odd females that should be breeding, only one is breeding at the moment and the others are not breeding because they're affected by chlamydiosis. I think it's pretty clear that those heat and drought events are a key player and my interest is now how does that affect the way the disease is manifested in the population. Our research focuses on how disease contributes to that decline. The local landholders are absolutely fantastic in this area. Everyone is realising just how significant this collapse is. In the drought, and we had them in care, and we had to feed them, we fed them in the morning and we fed them in the evening. More and more koalas kept coming into care and then we noticed that some of them were sick and then gradually it was found out that they had chlamydia, but it was pretty sad and horrible. And and then the drought hit and, and it was just so dry and we even got more and more koalas. That was just incredible. Every day there was a koala call. The heat was extraordinarily hot for a long time and it was extraordinarily dry. And you'd go to a place and there was a koala sitting at the base of a tree and it was often was dead. We got to know them as individuals and they were all individual, all had their little quirks. The fact that then they either died or released and that, and then then no more, it's very, very sad because, yeah, I really came to appreciate them as beautiful, beautiful animals. They were startlingly gorgeous. <laughs> the local community, everyone, from every walk of life, every single person that I came across in regard to koalas wanted to help them not just the Gunnedah community in the town, but in the outlying areas. Some of the people had animals on their properties for 12 years or something. They knew the animals, they knew they had seen their babies come along, they'd been woken up with it, screaming, yelling at night. They knew the, the whole thing, but they loved them. But then they keep saying, oh, we haven't seen our koalas for such a long time. The support that comes from the government through the local land services has also been really, really important. And they've also been able to pull in a lot of experts. People think, oh, it'll be all right. Well, it's not all right. I didn't, never thought I'd be in the midst of an extinction of, of, of a species such as a koala. I am absolutely horrified about it. There's only so much you can do, like climate change is a major player in this decline. And we can't do a lot about changing that quickly. It's a long, slow process. But on the ground, we can make the environment a little bit more friendly for koalas. We've noticed through the drought years how koalas are attracted to freestanding water and they really need to drink water a lot. They need to be able to get out of the extreme heat. We wanted to be able to enhance areas to provide more shade and improve the diversity of food sources. We developed a list of looking at what could benefit koalas and we identified these areas of crown land. So these areas have a real problem lacking regeneration. Thinking 50 years down the track, all these already old trees are going to be you know, senescent and dying and there's nothing to take their place. Parts of the travelling stock reserve system have been fenced off and regenerated. It's great that the local land services have got involved in doing this because it's putting action in the ground. The number one point I'd like to get across to people and to particularly landholders that retention of native vegetation is the number one thing that they can do. You can start doing things like habitat restoration to link those pieces of remnant vegetation. Remove some of the weeds, particularly things like tiger pear, which can be harmful to koalas. 
adding watering points, particularly during summer times if it's really hot. The other big thing also is, particularly for people on land, is to tie up their dogs at night too because koalas can often be attracted to homesteads because they're often watered gardens, there is free water there. LLS has been investing in koalas for a number of years through quite a few different streams of funding. Lots of work with community groups, land care, quite a lot of work with individual landholders, tree planting, lots of weed control as well. We've also worked quite a lot on public land, on travelling stock reserves as well. We've also partnered with other organisations such as Sydney University with some of their research and with other government departments as well. We will continue to work, I think, in, into the future and hopefully see some positive changes in the koala population. My hope is that um, we'll show that we can reduce the impact of chlamydiosis, reduce the transmission to new animals and allow animals repopulating the area to be able to do that. I really came to appreciate them as beautiful, beautiful animals. I was really surprised how much I'd fall for them, but I did. <laughs> and so when, they, when they've not been here, I've really missed them.